Welcome to Aging Insights. I'm Grace Egan, Executive Director of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. Our mission is to promote policies and programs that enable seniors to live with independence and dignity in their communities. Aging Insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for Aging to provide information and resources to boomers, seniors, and caregivers. Today we're going to talk about emergency preparedness. I have in the studio with me Michael S. Weber, Emergency Preparedness Manager, Electric from PSENG, and Melissa Acri, Executive Director of NJ211 Partnership. In previous Aging Insights programs, we've spoken about emergency plans and emergency supplies. It's important to have some minimal supplies on hand, like flashlight with batteries, water, and a supply of non-perishable foods. If you must evacuate, which we've seen in previous years, be sure and take your medications list, your medication, your contact numbers, your cell phone, and the charger. But today we want to talk about the services of NJ211 and your utility company that may help you be better prepared for an emergency and what assistance they may provide to you during a disaster. Thank you both for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I think it's an important topic. And Melissa, I understand that NJ211 is a national referral service that many states have as well. So please give our viewers a brief history of NJ211. Sure, Grace. Uh, NJ211 is a nonprofit and a nationally accredited organization that is 12 years young. Uh -huh. We are a subsidiary of the United Ways of New Jersey. And our service is to offer help and hope through information and referrals mm -hmm. uh, for health and human services. And we've been doing that, as I mentioned, for 12 years. And we can be reached by phone, chat, text, mm -hmm. email. We have over 10,000 resources in our database. Really? So, you know, I always think of it as a call service, but it's interesting that over the years you've really evolved into other um, ways to contact you. What kind of calls do you get? We get a wide variety of mm -hmm. calls from people all ages. Um, usually it's life's most basic needs. People mm -hmm. call for um, financial assistance with utilities, food, clothing, affordable housing, transportation. It's a wide gamut. Hmm. And who's answering the phone? We have highly trained community resource specialists mm -hmm. that go through initial two weeks of training and then continue throughout the year, uh, being well versed on social services and the systems we use and the varied programs that we assist with. Mm -hmm. You must have quite a database, I mean, I would we imagine. Do. We do. Over 3,000 agencies are represented, and as I mentioned, 10,000 services. Mm -hmm. um, and we do follow standards to make sure that the information is well vetted, it's up to date, and we have good relationships with the agencies that we have in our database. Mm -hmm. I understand that um, sometimes your staff may assist a caller with a, a warm referral, and I think yes. it's an interesting term. So can you explain to our sure. viewers? Um, a warm referral simply means that that caller has some needs that are identified by our specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be vulnerable in some way, um, and that by connecting the calling the agency on their behalf and giving a little introduction to the caller. We then directly transfer that caller over to the agency so it's seamless and they get the right help that they need. Mm -hmm. it's, is it easier, do you think, for people to find the services they need on your website versus calling? You know, I think it depends on the individual. Mm. Some people like to do their own research right. and they like to be on uh, a website and search our database. It's the same database that our community resource specialists use, um, but a lot of people still like talking to a person mm -hmm. because our specialists can really assess and often they'll come up with other things that might be beneficial and helpful for the caller mm -hmm. that they didn't even think about. So um, it really just depends on what right. the person prefers. Well, I also understand that you have a lot of languages listed, but I don't know that the website is in multi-languages, but the 
the staff is? The staff well, our handle? staff, we have bilingual staff. Mm -hmm. So many of our specialists are Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. And for anyone that calls in with any other language, we can use an interpreter service. So we have a three-way conversation mm -hmm. and the interpreter just uh, interprets that caller's needs. Um, we also have our website that can be translated into over 170 languages with the press of a button. Oh, your website can? Yes. Well, that's very helpful, so I think. So it really is multilingual, mm -hmm. free, confidential service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds very helpful. You know, today's program, we're really focusing on emergency preparedness, and NJ211, I know, has a special service called Register Ready. Yes. So I would really appreciate you explaining um, how it works and, and how you get the information and, you know, the process. Sure. Mm -hmm. Register Ready um, is an initiative that we're very proud to have been involved with for many years. And it really is a statewide database that captures the needs of seniors, and people with disabilities, anyone that may have an access um, or functional need that is important for the county to be prepared for. So they have a mobility issue. Correct, a okay. mobility issue. Okay. So what that what that means is that every person who has that type of need should register in Register Ready. And they should uh, do it themselves or the service we provide. And we encourage people to call 211, and our specialists will do it for them. They'll register them. It takes a few minutes mm -hmm. to answer all the questions. And then every year, they need to re register. So every year. Every year. Otherwise, it gets archived. Oh. And then the county is not aware of the needs yeah. of the individuals living there. So that's important. I didn't know that it's really only good for one year. I think that's that's important and I'm su yes. surprised and I'm sure many of our viewers who may have used the service in the past might be surprised as well. Tip people move and people things change. Correct. That makes sense. And typically people register when they register themselves, they'll get an email reminding them to do it. However, if 211 has registered them, they'll get an email, but they need to call 211 because the way the system works is we'll we have the information that we put in, so it's needed, we need to put it in this following year for them. Hmm. And I can't stress how important it is to do it in advance of a disaster. Oh, sure. That's the information that counties will refer to when they're making sure that their emergency readiness plans are intact. Well, that's really what I wanted to ask you. So once you have the list, what do you do with it? Well, the list is uh, managed by the state, and the different counties will access the database. So our role is just to enter the person into the system, mm -hmm. and then the counties will access those lists and prepare their counties accordingly. Okay, so I'm going to drill down a little bit. Okay. So NJ211, then it goes to the state, but you mean the Office of Emergency Management? Correct, the Office of Emergency Management okay. at the state level. But each county has an Office of Emergency Management, and mm -hmm. they look at their particular county's needs. How many people are in wheelchairs, so how many ramps okay. do we need, and so, so forth. And so during a disaster, you're presuming that people are pulling up that list in terms of helping people evacuate or serving yes. them in their home. And even in advance of the disaster because they're they're constantly making sure that they have up-to-date information um, today so that if something right. happens in two months they're ready for it. Exactly. And now you also provide some services during a disaster, is that right? We do. We actually are one of the partners involved in the state emergency management plan that we provide um, information before the, uh, 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 any type of mm -hmm. disaster. It could be natural or man-made. So we're pushing out information on safety, how to prepare people, prepare your homes for a disaster. Pushing it out where? To whom? We're pushing it out to the public so that people know they can call 211. We're going to give them the latest information that we have regarding for example, a storm that's coming, okay. uh, if there's any areas that are told they have to evacuate, we'll share that, where they can go for shelter, um, what they can do to prepare themselves and their homes. Mm -hmm. During a disaster, we are operating 24-7 as always, and we're the voice of reason during the disaster, so. <laughs> reminding people to be in safe places in their homes. Okay. 
Um, we can even escalate calls that are emergency calls that can't get through to 911. Oh, really? We sometimes can escalate those calls so that those those individuals can be helped. So you're still maintaining staff on the line during a disaster? Yes, we actually okay. increase and everyone is hands on deck 24 mm -hmm. seven. We did that for Hurricane Sandy right. and um, handled over 85,000 calls in three months. Did you tell me that you were actually sitting in the emergency, uh, Office of Emergency Management in Trenton? Um, we can do that, can or do that. we would be at our location and be on conference calls hourly, three times a day, that I would hmm. be hearing all of right. the latest information from the state. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. Now, wherever you are in New Jersey, we know that people have been struck by disasters or, or emergency situations. And oftentimes, it really is the utility company that is uh, you know, that's the first thing people realize. They don't have electricity or they, because they don't have electricity now, they don't have water and they don't have a variety of things that rely on their um, um, electric company. So I'm glad that Mike is here today. So I think it's important to understand um, the role of the electric, the utility companies during a disaster and what crucial services you can prepare. So uh, since you're from PSE&G, uh, Mike, what percentage of the households in the state are served by PSE&G? So we use our territory as, uh, as basically a, an area that goes from New York City to uh, Philadelphia. I, oh. I use the analogy, it's 10 or 15 miles each side of the turnpike, and it serves about 75% of the population of the state of New Jersey. We use three quarters of the citizens. 2.2 uh, .2 million electric meters, 1.8 million gas meters, oh. which interpret to about 6 million electric customers in the state. So it oh. is by far the largest majority. I was going to say, so it's, um, I'm happy to have you here so you can explain and probably people will understand it in terms of their own utility company, you know, what, um, what you do. I mean, so is there helpful information that people should tell their utility company? There are, there are several things that uh, folks can and should right. tell their utility company. Some of the things piggyback on what the folks at 211 mm -hmm. are, do, are doing uh, with Register Ready. Mm -hmm. um, when we sign a customer up, we'll ask if there are any medical issues in yeah. the house that we should be aware of. Uh, primarily medical life support units um, that where they're really dependent on electric. We'll ask them at the time right. to provide us the information. We will send them some information to confirm with their doctor, and then we'll go ahead really? and register those folks in our uh, system to know that they have those maybe extenuating right. circumstances uh, during the time of a power outage. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm going to interrupt for a second because I think now I've been in my particular home for 30 years. I have the same utility company, and I would have never thought of saying, oh, Things have changed either for my life circumstance in terms of mobility or for anybody else living with me. So I think that's kind of an interesting piece because you say about new customers, but it's probably helpful for um, ongoing customers to keep you up to date. It, it absolutely is. And like the folks at 211 update mm -hmm. annually, we do as well. Just to really? make sure conditions hadn't changed or changed, do you have a new person living in your house? Have your condition changed, uh, improved or, mm. or not improved? So we like to check in every year to make sure we're aware of it as well. And ultimately, it helps us in setting priorities for restoring customers. Mm. Well, when there is a disaster or there is a, um, you know, sometimes it's not a national disaster or a state disaster, it's a, a local power line that's down, whether it's an accident or something. How do you know there's a break in service? I'm just curious. So that's an interesting question. Here in 2017, mm -hmm. everyone presumes we know the lights are out. Yeah. Quite frankly, we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we talk about that. There are three ways to at least get to public service. And that you can call us at 1-800-436-PSEG. Mm -hmm. You can go on to uh, PSEG.com and you can register an outage as well. And then you can even text on social media, O-U-T to 4-P-S-E-G. Oh, well. Those are three avenues. Right. The, the point we like to stress is, even though you think we might not know, we might know, we do not know. So we really, it's important for folks to call. Right. And some of the things we're looking for them to provide us mm -hmm. are, uh, we call it the golden ticket in the utility. Tell us something that happened. There's a tree on a wire across the street from my house. That's helpful to us. 
because some of our circuits, based upon the age of our system, could run two or three miles through multiple towns. Sure. So if we don't know, if we don't have that golden ticket, we don't know where to begin to search for what could have put the power out, we have to send our troubleshooters uh, out to find out where that problem could be. So if you have information like that, that's most helpful to us mm -hmm. in expediting, at least identifying where the problem is, and then helping the restoration process. So besides telling you their particular incident, why their power's down and where they are, um, if they have not necessarily registered or told anybody in the past, you know, um, you know, my spouse relies on oxygen or somebody's in a motorized wheelchair and, um, you know, the battery is low. Right. Um, are those things that people should tell you too? Those are things they should tell us as well. Right. Uh, we always encourage folks to register right. with 211 because that really helps the emergency management folks to have an inventory of those people they potentially could worry about. Surely we're going to ask everyone to be prepared on their own as well. Mm -hmm. If you have backup batteries or backup abilities, right. if you may potentially be evacuated, mm -hmm. pay attention mm -hmm. and then make a plan to maybe go to an alternate location. So the emergency management folks right. don't have to have fewer people to worry about. Right. You know, I just noticed in a, um, a flyer from my utility company that it says, and be sure and keep your landline. Well, because they last longer during service, because, but given all of the cable networks that are providing phone service now, some of these landlines are not really landlines anymore. So it's kind of an interesting, I thought it was an interesting reference in the, in the handout. So how do you, you sort of mentioned prioritizing um, a response. How do you prioritize a response? So effectively, and we share this with um, all our large customers from, from the big hospital users sure. to mm -hmm. Rutgers, they all know. Our priorities when, during an outage are going to be hospitals, police and fire uh, stations or locations because we're trying to provide power to those emergency first responders who need to help folks in the community. Our priority customers mm -hmm. who have identified themselves will be right up in that priority as well. And then we typically look for, uh, we'll concentrate on blocked roads if it's an important mm -hmm. road that leads to a hospital or a critical area and then we will focus on, and almost all utility companies do the same thing, we focus on the largest uh, number of customers out because we're trying to restore as many back as possible. The last person to be restored will be folks like myself <laughs> who live on the end of the cul-de-sac. Right. Those one-offs at the end of the cul-de-sac, unfortunately, we need to prepare a little bit better because uh, we're right. trying to get the most, uh, the most customers back the quickest possible. Mm -hmm. And so is there a difference, I guess, you know, between utility between electric and gas. I guess it's, if you lose electricity, you don't necessarily lose your source of natural gas, right? That's correct. You, not not typically. Uh, you could typically we'll see about it. we'll see a loss of gas in more of a flood environment when there's flooding involved. And interestingly enough, then the restoration process will start a couple days later with a flooding incident because it still takes time to for the waters to recede, mm -hmm. and then to uh, clean that equipment and then to access every house. Mm. So you must have some safety tips for customers during a power outage? One thing we always try to stress during any kind of outage, large or small, mm -hmm. is that please stay away from downed wires. Mm. We have trained professionals who work with them. They wear their proper equipment knowing the power is energized or not energized oh. on that line because we always presume it's a live wire. So we tell folks that we train internally, stay at least 50 feet away from any wire. We don't necessarily know what wire it is. In some, most cases we do, our trained professionals who are out there every day can tell you if it's a cable wire, a telephone mm. wire, or our wire. But if you're looking at it from a you distance, don't you don't know. So we ask you really to be very cautious. We also stress because we have a fair amount of customers who have backyard service to please. I'm sorry, what they is? Have, they'll have, uh, their power comes in. Instead of having street poles, oh. poles on the street in front of the house, mm -hmm. they'll have backyard service where the poles go hmm. through the backyards. Interesting. We ask them to be even more careful hmm. uh, if there is a, an incident and you have down trees, down poles or down wires, because you don't know where that wire is. Uh, and we ask them to be even more cautious uh, when they're exploring, trying to assess the damage to their house. Do you ask them not to assess the damage? Yes. For the most part, we okay. do. Okay. For right. the most part, we do. We will uh, we'll ask them to report it, mm -hmm. to report that they have power out at their house. Mm -hmm. and give us some specifics. There's a broken pole in my backyard. That's helpful. But for the most part, 
let, let, let mm -hmm. us do that. Mm -hmm. And um, are you presuming that when you call there's an outage that you're actually speaking to a person? So there's several ways in. Okay. As I mentioned, there's electronic, uh, and okay. the system will catch that. You can call in, and we give you the option. If you just want to report an okay. outage, hit, hit a certain number, and that'll get recorded. Mm -hmm. Or you can stay on the line and, and talk to someone. If you have some vital information that, that's helpful to us, we ask you to stay on the line. Our computer system will, will take all those calls that are on similar circuits and then identify. It, it will then draw a conclusion that there must be going something on in a speci specialized area mm -hmm. or a specified area. Mm -hmm. So all those calls do add up and they are helpful to us for determining exactly what circuits uh, may be impacted. Mm -hmm. Well, I also understand that besides the utility work that um, a utility company also works with first responders or local emergency responders. So how is that relationship developed? So we're doing that throughout the year mm -hmm. through either a series of exercises that we do both on the electric and gas side. And that primarily is at the uh, county and municipal level where we'll involve police departments, fire departments, offices of emergency management, the emergency operations centers, EMS. We'll, we'll, we'll do exercises. We've done 10 exercises in gas simulating a, oh. a gas leak environment uh, we did 12 over the last two years and we're in the process of doing six more. It gives us an opportunity to interact under uh, practice conditions, if you would, mm -hmm. exercise conditions, to see how our plans and policies and procedures hold up to an actual incident. Uh, we, during a large outage, if a county requests, we will send uh, liaisons to sit in the county location and be kind of our eyes and ears mm -hmm. at the uh, a county location. We serve 11 counties throughout the state. So we'll send a liaison. The liaison will work with the emergency coordinator in that town, in that, I'm sorry, in that county, mm -hmm. to help us set priorities for how they want to restore customers throughout the state. So there's multiple times we're interacting uh, with state, uh, municipal, and county. Uh, agencies. And certainly before a disaster, as you say, the training efforts give you that contact. Right. And then you probably have a relationship with the, the state office of emergency management as well? We do. We'll also send a liaison to the state regional operations and intelligence center mm -hmm. if it's a large enough incident. Mm -hmm. So we'll have eyes and ears there as well. So uh, folks can get in contact with us and we can get in contact with them. Mm -hmm. And we also have relationships with our larger customers, as I, as I mentioned, strong relationships with Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and Rutgers and a lot of our, our bigger clients as well. I, I think you also mentioned, well, not a client, but the Red Cross? So we do a lot with the Red Cross. We've mm -hmm. teamed up on providing some training to our uh, employees as well. We use the Red Cross uh, in uh, programs that are we're trying to do some more emergency preparedness and making sure our families are prepared mm -hmm. for an extended incident when the reality is our employees may need to be in work for oh. an extended period. Uh, unlike a lot of mm. uh, circumstances, our employees will be at work at extended hours during a disaster as opposed to home waiting for conditions to improve. We're in the process of improving conditions so people can resume their lives. I think you bring up an interesting point because that person who's on the line is not is not home taking care of his own flooded basement or her own flooded basement. So I think that's probably an important service. I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, I want them to come to my house mm. <laughs> and they have their own needs as well. Right. And we train and educate and try to help our employees make sure they're ready before hurricane season mm -hmm. uh, and throughout the year in case they have to get called to work for an extended period. So you tell them to have ready kits too, or what do we, what do we call it, emergency kits? Emergency kits, just, go kits, yep, mm -hmm. whatever, you want to, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I liked your point earlier when you started. You talked about the important things to, happen, mm -hmm. to have. Uh, prescriptions are very important, mm -hmm. even if you just have a copy of the script. Right. We also encourage people to have small denominations of cash. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Because ATMs typically will be down. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were during Sandy, so mm -hmm. we say you should have uh, some small denominations uh, just to, in case you go to a facility right. that can't make change or the credit card doesn't work. Right, I hadn't thought of that. You know, um, one thing in Sandy when we have done the show previously, they said that, you know, one, the medications and the scripts and contact numbers, but people would bring their phone and not their charger. Right. And so it really limited their communication with, you know, their other family members and different things like that. And I know pets are not the job of PSE&G or any utility company, but I think 
I think um, local communities are getting more savvy about how to help people with their pets during a disaster as well. And you can call 211 okay. because we do give information on pet friendly uh, shelters and places where people can bring pets mm -hmm. during a, an emergency mm -hmm. or a disaster. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's helpful to get the sense of how you work together and what information you can both provide during a disaster. I mean, I would have never thought of calling 211 to kind of get an update. You know, because sometimes you, if you have the ability to call out, you don't know who to call. Right. And it was interesting during Hurricane Sandy to hear callers say, I have no power. And we would say, you're one of many, 2.4 yeah. million people. You know, we would let them know they're not alone. Mm -hmm. We'd let them know anything that we had heard from the utility company as far as an update. Mm -hmm. So we were, you know, a conduit of information for them from different places that we get gain the information mm -hmm. from. And I imagine it provides a level of comfort. I mean, you know, to know you're not the only one sitting in the dark. Yes. Um, listening to your neighbor's generators as opposed to that you don't have one, but that you're feeling, you know, very isolated. So I think right. that's good to know that you can provide that ad additional level of service. Right. So anyway. So last tips, you know, how to reach you is ob obviously. Yes. It's, it's 211 are the numbers you need to remember. If you okay. want to text us, it's 898-211, or you can go to our website, nj211.org, to either chat or to search our database. Can you say the text again? Sure. 898-211. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. And obviously for the utility companies, um, you know, in most people's bills, they have obviously an emergency number. And so um, for PSE&G? The, probably the best source would be the website as well, PSEG.com. Mm -hmm. It'll give you a lot of different resources from mm -hmm. preparedness, things you can do, right. similar items to your go kits, as well as social media uh, ways to get in touch with mm -hmm. us as well. Yeah. I also think sometimes for our viewers, sometimes phoning is the best. So we really will put both options and everything on, on the uh, screen. But thank you both very much. I really appreciate you spending the time with us today and sharing. I think it's an important program. So um, Aging Insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. We want to remind you to find out about senior services. Please contact your county office on aging. You will see a listing of their numbers on our website, or you may call the state hotline number, which is 1-877-222-3737. Thank you for watching this episode of Aging Insights, and remember, Aging is everyone's business.